What is up, everybody? Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm here with Brian, and we're here with a very special guest tonight, right, Brian? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, very excited to talk. Yes, very excited, because I'll tell you what, one of the absolute most nerve-wracking conversations I've ever had was the first time we ever had Rom V on the channel. Like, I was so nervous because he's got beautiful hair. He's a very intellectual guy. He is a fantastic writer and comic book creator and a great artist as well. And man, I rewatched that this week, Brian, and I was just giddy the entire yep. time. I'm com I'm so completely surprised we held that show together, man. Yeah, we, we were both fanboying out pretty hard. Um, and I remember afterwards I had to go hike in the woods for a little while to, you know, kind of bring all the emotions back down and everything yeah. like that. So, but, but now we're a little bit more seasoned. Yep. Right. And so we can, I think we're going to have a good conversation tonight. So, Everybody, you know him, you love him. He is straight up a mega superstar right now in the comic book world. He's writing one of DC's flagship books, Detective Comics, bringing the one, the only, Rom V Station. Hey, how's everyone doing? Uh, doing great, man. Thank you for joining us, man. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed the last time we had a chat, so keep on getting. Um, and... and <laughs> I just so cool, Rom. <laughs> part of why I reached out was like, you know, this is it's nice to have conversations that aren't, you know, the usual sort of what characters do you want to write? Where do you want to? What's your next thing? What's your upcoming thing? I thought the conversation was super interesting. So, um, yeah. I pleasure to be back. Well, I appreciate you reaching out. And uh, you were talking about Vigil coming up on the horizon. And you yeah. wanted to kind of chat a little bit about that. And you were gracious enough to send us like some early process looks at things. And Man, I'm really pumped for the vigil. I saw it when it uh, debuted in the Lazarus Planet one shot. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then to see what your idea of what this book is supposed to be and where it's going to develop, I am very, very excited for that. So vigil. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's safe to say people have no idea where the book is going from. From. Here. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um. So it's a brand new superhero team set in the DC universe all original characters. Why don't you tell us a little bit about The Vigil? Yeah, so The Vigil actually came about um, when my editor, Jessica Chen, reached out. She said she's doing an imprint of um, Asian characters, um, wanted, wanted to have them introduced into the DCU. And I had actually talked several times at DC about wanting to introduce more Indian characters into the DCU. Obviously, uh, wear my heart on my sleeve. So Swamp Thing, uh, my first effort was to bring in Levi Kamei there. Um, I took Randir Singh, who I think is perhaps DC's oldest Indian character. Uh, it comes from the Kirby run on Demon. I uh, took him in Justice League Dark and yeah. did something with that. So I said, okay, I have this opportunity to create original characters, which is something I've always wanted to do. My immediate second thought was, Oh God, everyone's going to expect me to do mythology and gods and demons because the moment you think India, that's what you tend to think about. Um, and so I kind of wanted to push away from that. So this is a weird, wild, sci-fi, modern, neo-espionage, noir, um, superhero team book, more in the vein of things like Planetary, Doom Patrol, um, some of the some of the Wildstorm Authority stuff, um, but from a distinctly Indian perspective. I mean, part of the thing I really enjoyed about those books is that they they looked at American popular culture and American sci-fi with this kind of zany comics lens. Um, I kind of wanted to do that with a country that wasn't America, that was India, and has its own conspiracy theories and has its own obsessions. Um, so yeah, so. That's kind of where the idea for the visual germinated from. Uh, and I haven't written a proper spy thriller comic uh, yet. And so that was something I wanted to get into as well. So there's very techy stuff, but there's also very grounded Indian spy craft going on there. You mentioned a planetary influence on this, and that's what I like because so is it going to be like single issue stories that kind of connect to like a larger narrative that's developing? Yeah, to an extent. Um, I think 
I do want to take those contained story ideas. Uh, so, so pretty much every issue does look at a new plot, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be constrained by that format either. So if I want to take like a couple of issues to, to do another story at some point, then I will. But the idea is that you're never embroiled in some story that's going on for, for eight or nine issues. They're solving the here and now. But then in the background are the rumblings of this much bigger, much crazier plot that will eventually come to bear, um, you know, given enough time. Well, you know, not to break kayfabe, but I read the script for issue number one. And thank you for graciously sharing that. That was it was, yeah. first of all, a joy to, to see your script with all of your art notes and everything in there. Like something <laughs> that looked like this. And I just like, whoa, and I love seeing the inside of it. And uh I guess I have your phone number now, so I won't share that. But uh, oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I, I never, I never pick up my phone anyway. Okay, good. Fifty dollars <laughs> chat. We'll give you Ron B's number. Um, Brian, did you get a chance to check out the stuff I sent you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. And I, I did. Yeah, as I was reading the the concept piece, um, yeah, I was thinking. I was like, well, this sound, kind of sounds like planetary, and I'm in. And then like three sentences later, it said, think planetary. And I was like, Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I was there. Cause I, yeah, this is a, uh, those, those storylines and stuff like that is always, always fascinating. And, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to learning more about, you know, you were mentioning the Indian conspiracies and stuff like that. That, you know, yeah, that, that's, that sounds like great ground to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, one of the examples I was talking about on a, on a different interview uh, was uh, years ago, I posted on Twitter that there were, these um, knockoff Indian comics, uh, which featured, you know, like a, a Batman and a Superman come to India and they fight this Indian villain who's a magician and they can't do anything because he's too powerful. And then the Indian superhero has to step in to save them. And clearly these were not signed off by Marvel or DC because it had Batman, Superman and Spider-Man in the same comic <laughs> fighting. Um, and clearly these were not signed off. But if we if we now say that alternate realities exist because i'm able to write in the dcu i can say that okay in this alternate reality uh if there is a knockoff batman and superman that are only like one fifth as powerful as the originals if five of them get together can they take out one of the one of the main sort of you know you know what i mean strangers on the train you take out my guy i take out your guy kind of business so th there's potential to do stuff like that uh, which I don't think I've seen in comics since that era of like, what are you smoking, Morrison or like Warren Ellis <laughs> going like, oh man, I'm gonna talk about the fifth dimension for like three issues in a row. Um, yeah. So, so I kind of wanted to hearken back to that. No, no, we're we're still allowed to be crazy about sci-fi. Uh, I feel like we've gotten to an era where everybody knows how things work, and so it's very difficult to talk about uh things that that engender curiosity and wonder and fascination but they're still there mm -hmm. if you look uh and so so i think that's a very interesting uh direction to push in yeah definitely yeah that's yeah that's very exciting yeah i like you mentioned that because yeah sometimes it it does seem like some of the science fiction stuff is kind of you know a little stale i guess maybe because it's you know i don't uh Maybe it's just my memory, but you know, I don't know. It's it's been a while since I've read something that kind of pushed, <laughs> you know. Yeah, pushed yeah. I feel like direction. I feel like it takes itself too seriously now. Like, and this is coming from someone who was a scientist in a in a previous career. I feel like science fiction now takes itself too seriously uh, in that it has to comment on the here and now all the time. But it's science fiction. It's always going to do that. You don't have to. You don't have to obsess about that anymore. And it'd be nice once in a while to see science fiction that's just like, nope, we're going to go crazy. You're not going to understand half of this, but it's fine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what that, we that, need that, more that, of, I think, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was that one was of the like, things I loved about Planetary was like, you know, when you use like the information things and and all these things. Like, you know, I, I I've got an engineering background too, but some of that stuff I was like, yeah, it sounds yep. so cool. It sounds so great. <laughs> yeah, and then it, it makes you it makes you look up stuff, which which mm -hmm. you then use and you imbibe, and you 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 realize that science at the fringes is not nearly as uh, sort of square footed and and well based as we think it is. So yeah, correct. 
Who's the uh, the rest of the team on this book? Uh, so the artist is Lalit Kumar Sharma, who uh, is a artist of Indian fame. He's drawn a lot of very popular Indian comics, uh, but he also did a short run on Daredevil uh, at Marvel, and he was part of the DC uh, workshop. Uh, and I think I think he did a couple of short stories as part of that as well. Um, so he's jumping in on the art duties. Uh, Sumit Kumar is doing uh, all the covers, uh, and potentially Sumit might be in for an arc uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Anand Radhakrishnan is doing all the variant covers, uh, and yeah, I think I think that's it for now. Uh, we're not sure. I'm not sure yet who the colorist and letter are going to be, so we'll see. Uh, I know Aditya. If you're if you ever see this interview, he was dying to be on this project, but he was like, "Oh man, my health concerns." Because because you realize it's an almost an all Indian creative team, yeah, uh, sure. which is which is quite uh, quite quite a new thing, quite unusual, um, and I don't think would have happened, you know, if it wasn't for all the work that we have done now in the international industry. Um, so, so that felt like a culmination of efforts and I wish other day could have been there, but too bad. <laughs> yeah, I wish too, but I'm sure you're going to assemble the, the, the rest of the team perfectly fine. It's, a uh, reading the stuff that I got to read today and seeing some of the art, I'm really, really pumped for this book. Like I'm always pumped for a new piece from you, but like when I saw the pitch and the, the script and the art, like, and I was piecing it together, if I was an editor at DC, I'd be like, okay, I'm giving you. Uh, as long as you want on this title, you're going to keep doing it as long as possible. But, you know, that's just because I want more of this kind of stuff from you. I want more yeah, of that yeah. weird sci-fi stuff. I want I want you to be able to scratch that that spy thriller noir espionage itch, you know, and get as yeah. crazy and high concept as possible, but still have it rooted in some really interesting characters and yeah. and, uh, and ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is very much the case. Um, the book starts off very grounded and then about three issues in, you're like, what, where the hell is this going? I had no idea it was going to end up here. Like, um, yeah, well, we, we start off with like two spies on a bench in Mumbai, but by the end of it, we, we, I think um, without giving too much away, we end up in an idea space that does not exist within the four dimensions that we know of. So, uh, that said, like, that's the kind of book this is, you know, it, it, it turns on a dime two or three pages in you, you get new wild ideas thrown at you constantly. Um, and yeah, I, last time I did that was something I think similar to Justice League Dark, right? So yeah. with the library of Babel and, and all those kind of meta fictional ideas. So there's more of that uh, in this book. Uh, and, you know, the perks are these are characters I created. So I kind of know them inside out and I'm not beholden to any past histories. Yeah. 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 And that's a cool thing too, creating your own piece within the DC universe and being able to explore that. So you mentioned like dealing with like conspiracy theories that are based in India, but like you're also in the DC universe. Are you going to be able to like kind of play in that ground and, and mix all that in and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, issue one, they're stealing. I mean, issue one, there's something that happens. They're not stealing. There's something that happens with a Lex Corp cargo. Um, aboard a ship so it's right there in issue one uh and i think part of the part of the pitch was also that the dc universe also has its own or should have its own conspiracy theories i mean um you know metal, heavy metal happened and all these characters came back and no one seems to question why they came back how they came back or if there are multiple versions of these characters running around and these are conspiracy theories these are things that will be whispered in the between the panels in the gutters of the of the dc universe and yeah that's exactly where this team lies yeah. see i love that because if you're just the average citizen in the dc universe you are aware of the multiverse you're aware of aliens you're aware of you're <laughs> yeah. aware of so many different things and so imagine like the talk that that would kind of spur around that like with the the lazarus planet stuff with the reins of the lazarus like oh yeah. this was all a, a false flag or this was a uh, all made for specifically for this one purpose and things like that there's so much room to explore there yeah 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 and i and 
you have to be careful with that. You don't want to become too sort of inward looking because the whole idea of the conspiracy theory from a reader's point of view is like, it could be real. And so, so I think that part of that joy means the conspiracy theories have to be things that you and I have thought of. And uh, I'm not sure people spend too much of their time thinking about Lazarus Planet Rain, uh, but the Philadelphia experiment, ships disappearing, where did they go? How does that tie into, um, you know, extra dimensions? How does that tie into the bleed where the authority travels? There's, there's all kind of, there's all kind of stuff that's possible when you start connecting real dots with fictional dots. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that too. So, uh, I know that you're, you're, you're a great writer and stories have beginning, middles and ends, but Rom, why couldn't we get like, I don't know, a hundred more issues of Swamp Thing, man. Come on. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, we, we might yet. I have plenty more years of writing left in me. Um, you, you got some ideas maybe to, to go back to Levi and go back to that world possibly? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm having conversations about future projects, future commitments, both at DC, outside of DC, but yeah, it's not, it's not out of the question that, you know, having, having taken some time from the book, you know, go back to it, do another 10, 16 issue piece, and then, you know, keep doing that. But it doesn't, I guess, part of the reason um, I am the kind of writer that I am is because I also get bored very easily. And so uh, detective is probably the longest thing I have attempted in, in a while. Uh, and the way I keeping that interesting for myself is like every arc from here on is going to have a completely different aesthetic, completely different take on Batman, even though it's telling one story. Um, and so, but you can't do that with every book. You can do that with detective because detective's been around for years. It's going to be around after I've, I'm off the book. But with the Swamp Thing in particular, that book was, it was existing as long as I was writing it. And so I felt like I wrote it to a point where I felt happy about saying, okay, this is where we end for now. I like that for now, because yeah, that yeah. is a character and you were able, because I remember when we had you on last time, only the first issue had come out. Now everything's completed. I love the book. I, it's it's exactly. so freaking amazing. What I loved about it is, and I don't know how much was your choice, how much was the editor's decisions and things like this, but it seemed like at times that they were like, hey, there's Suicide Squad movie coming out. Integrate the Suicide Squad in, right? And sometimes yeah, yeah. when I can see that as a reader, it throws me out. But mm. everything felt so organic. Like when the Suicide Squad were there with chemo and everything, it all felt organic and tied yeah, into yeah. the themes that you were exploring. And then it was a very satisfying ending. And you were talking about the dangers and the excitement of being the, of having the, the, the weight of the Alan Moore stuff. Right. Sure. And you were able to tread that ground, create something new, play with it and, and build your own stuff out of it. That I thought was absolutely phenomenal. And I loved the way that that, that story wrapped up. I know Brian's a big fan, right? Oh yeah. 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 That was a fantastic run. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I do wish there were more, but I really, yeah, that, that end was very satisfying. I, I thought, you know, tied everything really well together and, and yeah, like, yeah, I, I didn't really notice necessarily that, you know, the inclusion of like Peacemaker and that stuff was, I, you know, I was watching the show at the time, but no, it, it was, it, it moved the story and uh, you know, it was, it was great. Yeah. To be, to be honest, I think that's part of the joy of working in comics, right? Like you're supposed to be told every now and then that, Oh, we need you to include this character. And then the joy of writing that comic is, oh, I have to figure out how this aesthetically completely different team now fits into my book. So when that question was presented to me, that's exactly what I said. Okay, Suicide Quad, no problem. But I get to pick who comes in as part of the Suicide Squad. And really the reason it feels organic is I knew what I wanted to do with that story. So when I went and looked at the roster, I was like, okay, who can I pick that lets me tell the story anyway? Um, and so that kind of uh, presence of mind and pivoting your story is part of the challenge. It's like, it's like working on a live show, right? It's like writing mm -hmm. for whatever, Saturday Night Live or something. You have to, you have to come up with content 
based on things that have happened in the week prior. Otherwise, otherwise you're boring. Otherwise, why do it? Go right, go right like prestige television at that point. So uh, I think that's part of the joy of being in comics. And I continue to continue to write that stuff, uh, continue to comply with all editorial requests because, <laughs> because I look at them and I go like, oh, like there's, there's two ways you could react. You could react to it. You could either say that, oh my God, I have to incorporate this thing into my, into my story. Or you go like, oh, that's an interesting crinkle. How can I continue telling my story anyway? Um, mm -hmm. While still using that as a device to do it. So yeah. Last time you were on the channel, you know, the question always comes up, which characters would you like to write? And you said, you don't think of characters, you think of a story and then you yeah. think of what character would fit that story. And so I like that you just said that like, okay, well, I, I'll use Suicide Squad, but I get to pick who because I'm going to pick the right combination of characters to help me tell the story I was already yeah. wanting to tell. And I think that's so amazing because other people would just maybe be like, M if it's just like a job, you know, and yeah. you don't really care as much, you just throw it in there and it's silly and it's fun and it's cool, but it still maintains this, the Swamp Thing. Those 16 issues are still, I mean, I think that's a perennial book. I think like, if we can get like a good complete like edition of it all together, that's something I'll I'll keep on my shelves for years and years and years at the shop for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and and I know people at DC are also equally happy about that book. So it's really nice to have that from the fans, from critics and reviewers, and and press, and to have it from the back office at DC going like, oh, you know, I read all of our stuff and I haven't enjoyed a Swamp Thing run in a long time. Uh, as much as this. So, uh, so no, I, the love for that book was, has been amazing. And just to go back to the character story balance that we were talking about, um, Aquaman Andromeda is a great example of that, where Black Label came up and said, hey, we want you to do a Black Label story based off of an existing DC character. What character would you pick? And I went back and said, actually, let me go away. Think about this. And I knew I had a survival horror story set in, you know, something like Event Horizon. I wanted to do that. And I, and I knew I had the ability to do that. And my brain just went, wait, if I set it in the DCU, I can do it under the ocean. And it would be, it would be an Aquaman story um, because we'd be, we'd be looking at Aquaman as an alien entity at that point. Uh, and so that's how Aquaman Andromeda was born. Um, and I don't think anyone had had that take where most of the DC books assume that everyone knows their superhero. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a book where that assumption was not valid. No one knows about Aquaman or very few people know about Aquaman. Only people familiar with the sea know about the legend of the king beneath the sea. Uh, and so that's how that, that book came about. And I think I wouldn't be able to do that if I wasn't the kind of person who thought about stories rather than thinking about characters or what I want to do with them. You know, one of the things, first of all, I'm a big mark for Aquaman. Like I just, I love Aquaman so much. He's my favorite DC hero. And that, that goes all the way back to when I was a kid in the eighties and I had my Aquaman superpowers figure for my, for the, for the bathtub play and stuff like that. But, uh, so I he's like, my, he's my favorite character to sketch. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, big you flowing hair. hair. Yeah, do you like yeah, long hair? Yeah, yeah, of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> Fluttering in the wind. Giant <laughs> the I love Is yeah. that you, it kind of almost like the way Morrison and Quietly approached Superman in All-Star Superman, where he always felt bigger. He mm -hmm. always felt something outside. He always felt majestic and, and impactful. Aquaman felt like that to me in that book. And Christian Ward had a lot to do with that, right? The yeah, art yeah, was amazing. The black mana, everything was so menacing and threatening. I loved how mythical Aquaman seemed in that book. And I love that you said that it kind of started as an idea of like an event horizon type thing. Let's put that underwater. Are Because when I'm reading it, I'm like, my, one of my favorite silly things just to read all the time, one of my favorite writers from very young was Michael Crichton. And yeah, my favorite yeah, book from Michael yeah. Crichton is Sphere. So is there a Sphere influence in there? Yeah, yeah, of course. Like it's yeah. taking, it is absolutely taking that trope. The Sphere, Abyss, um, you know, Event Horizon. Basically the idea is a group of people who don't know enough are entering an environment 
that is far crazier than they thought it was. Uh, and instead of learning more about the environment, the environment stays an enigma and they learn more about themselves. That's the trope. That's the trope across all of these sort of stories, ideas, books. Um, and so now if you think about it, putting Aquaman in that, um, in that scenario kind of means that the readers, if they are as they should be kind of following the human beings in the story, Aquaman becomes that vast unknowable entity that remains enigmatic and unknowable at the end but you learn more about yourself through your interactions, through your, through your story with him. Yeah. Was the, uh, the design of having like almost like coral on his, like as armor or something, was that your idea? Was that Christian? Like, did you guys come up with that together? Uh, the coral specifically, I think was born out of a conversation we had at the beginning. So Christian said, what do you want to do with the design? Here are some ideas I'm thinking, because Christian wanted to do the, um, Bram Stoker's Dracula red armor thing um, from the Gary Oldman yeah. uh, movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so you can now, if you think about it, you can now see that in, in the green armor that, that Christian designed. My only note to that was, okay, great. Can we take that, put that under the ocean for like 200 years and have like, crusty barnacle crap growing all over it and the reference image i remember sending him was they found like a, a greek statue under the under the ocean after hundreds of years and they, they pull it out and it it just looked horrifying but also it was like one of those sort of grecian adonis beautiful human being beautifully carved statues and so i said that's what our aquaman should feel like someone who is like the perfection of like a human physique, but has been underwater for 200 years. Yeah. Oh, Do you oh, have like yeah, a no, morgue no. file where you like, if you see an image that's striking and maybe spurns an idea, do you save it somewhere? Or is it just kept in your head or just something of the moment that you noticed? No, Google image search is a wonderful tool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't need morgue files anymore. Right. You're just like, I have an idea. Let me look it up like this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's literally, I do the same thing with music and I do the same thing with images. I just Google stuff that I'm interested in. And then I spend about half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. This is why my scripts are late. Just scrolling through walls <laughs> of images. Going like, I need to find the one interesting one. <laughs> one of our followers from India has a question. Uh, when do you think we'll be able to read your work in singles as they come out in India? Currently, we got to wait a long time for trades. You got any idea on that? Probably not your, not your pay level, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not a question of uh, DC trying to make them available. I think the problem is that India doesn't have that sort of large direct market structure, right? It doesn't have those sort of, I don't know, two or three comic book stores in every single city. Um, so, so you don't have that sort of monthly, I go every Wednesday into a comic book shop and pick up a single um, culture, whereas the reason it exists now in in pretty much i think only in america maybe some parts of europe uh is because um that culture has been there for for decades so yeah absolutely so just keep spreading the word of comics raul and then we'll hopefully try to grow that audience right so uh, set up Vern a comic book store yeah, yeah start a comic book store absolutely uh, my buddy Verno from Blood Splatter Chatter says, would love to hear what it was like working with Hickman on the world building for Three Worlds, Three Moons, and what he thinks of that process. Yeah, I mean, I, I continue to do some of that. In fact, I've just been talking to Jonathan um, on that book, and you might see more of me there. Um, but I, I'm a big Jonathan Hickman fan. If it wasn't immediately apparent from my work, um, parody, so the design aesthetics in blue and green, all of that, very Hickman inspired. Uh, and so it was pretty exciting when, when he reached out and he was like, Hey, I'd love you to love for you to contribute to this world that we're building. I remember having this kind of funny fanboy despair. So I, he said, okay, pick what you want to write about. I said, well, I'm going to write about the economics of this place. Uh, which I thought was an interesting, like, I was trying to push myself because, yeah, I, I could write about magic. I could write about religion. So 
um, and then I found out Al was writing about religion. And my document was like a two A4 pages. Here's the big picture idea. And then Al's document was like a neo-theocratic text, 16, 16 <laughs> volumes of like the detailed charts of prayer to the 18 gods who existed. I'm like, oh, were we supposed to do that? But John was, Jonathan was like, no, no, as long as you feel like this is a good idea that you would build your story off of. And um, yeah, for, for a moment, I was like, should I go into more detail? But then genuinely, that's how I, I, I don't do the whole, I've got 18 volumes of research text that I wrote. Um, no, I have, I have an idea and then everything else is on the page. So um, yeah, that's how that came about. It, it was funny. Like I would never second guess myself, but I was like, wait a minute, it's for Jonathan Hickman. Should I be writing more? <laughs> should I be sending him graphic design stuff too? <laughs> yeah, should I, should I have a chart? Should I have real time economic simulations of these planets? <laughs> <laughs> Just supply demand curves everywhere. <clears throat> we got to meet uh, Jonathan last year at Heroes Con and such a cool dude. And luckily we had Nick Patera who had like, like let him know that these guys are cool. So when they show up, like, spend some time with him and he was a super cool dude man super cool yeah dude. yeah yeah lovely lovely guy I've met, I've met him a couple of times now hung out with him in new york um at, at comic con there uh and just yeah just great to talk to um always forthcoming with great advice uh so yeah no brilliant brilliant are you a soccer guy. fan a soccer fan, a football yeah. fan. If I call it soccer, no, my bad. Are you a football you. fan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll get. I, I mean, I'm in. I'm in England. I'm yeah. in London. I'll get beaten up if I say soccer. <laughs> People will remember this interview and they will find me. That's right. Are you a? Are you a, a football fan? Because I know that that Hickman is. Have you guys had conversations about that stuff? Oh, I haven't. I haven't talked to him about it. Um, you have I, to, man. He's a big fan. He is. Well, he he I, played. Uh, he played at Clemson. I understand. Right. Like, right. yeah. And yeah, I am. I am. I'm a big Manchester United fan, which is always oh. hilarious because everyone's like, oh, Manchester United, not those guys. So, um, no, but, but I was in India when I started watching. Uh, and my first game, I remember, was uh, that sort of classic class of 19, 1992, I think. Um, Ryan Giggs, David Beckham uh gary neville roy Keane, all of those guys were in the same team and so um yeah no it was it was a it was a great time to be watching i've followed football and Manchester united ever yeah. since well maybe yeah, you I'm should a, send I'm, jonathan I'm, an I'm sorry i was gonna say maybe you should send jonathan like a 16 volume thing about the the world of football in three worlds three moons right <laughs> they're, they're sports right <laughs> i mean there are that should be a sport with six balls involved, two of them small. No, yeah. I'm <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm an Arsenal supporter, actually. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a, uh, it, and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. The, con congratulations. This will be this will be your year. It it uh it it it's, it's the I, I was saying uh, the other day. I was like, this is the first time in about twelve years I think I've been this excited about how Arsenal is doing. It's been uh, yeah yeah it's been no I mean mostly downhill for a while. They've had that sort of close, but not close enough tag for a while and it feels like this year um they're actually they're actually sort of backing up that claim which is nice yeah 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 and it's i just find that Premier League fascinating actually because i mean there's just like i mean it seems like you know there's always the dominant teams and everything but it's it's ebbing and flowing a lot you know and and uh i don't, I don't know yeah yeah it's an it's an exciting exciting competition to watch i i keep i keep watching it's my one sort of obsessed sports uh pastime that that i will keep otherwise i'm usually i'm usually pretty chill about sports otherwise yeah i uh you know i'm not the biggest uh I, i've never dived too big into being a, a football fan you know i mean i like american football right but uh yeah, yeah. this year i, I used to, when i was in philadelphia i used to support i used to go to eagles games i used to support the eagles so ah uh, man rom i liked you so much <laughs> I mean, a Cowboys to be, fan. To be, to be fair, it was Donovan McNabb and Terrell Owens mm. the one year they played well together. So yeah, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> To man. Yeah. Then he came to Dallas, and oh my god. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say that the World Cup final this year, like I watched yeah. that, I was riveted in that yeah. whole thing, man. That was nuts. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great game. It's a great game. 
Yeah, it is. Football, we're talking about everybody. Uh, so that mom doesn't get... This is now a sports podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. We should put our caps on. And, yeah. Speaking of uh, sports, Detective Comics, you're writing one of um, DC's <laughs> flagship books. You're doing a Batman book. I mean, Rom, you're a superstar right at this point. Like you, You're one of the biggest names in current comics. And that's why Jonathan came after you, because he respects and loves your work. <laughs> right? And so I'm curious, because... You, you mentioned you have stories first. How does it fit to a character? Did you have this story and then you figured out like when you were offered detective, like this would work as a Batman story? Is that how that came about? Well, I had a take um, in this in this particular case because it was uh, I went to DC and I said, hey, I would like to do detective next whenever that book becomes available uh, if right, you, so you, yeah, you yeah. busted in the room and you were like, I want Detective Comics. I want your longest running title. <laughs> I mean, I didn't say I want. I said I'd love to be on that book whenever it becomes available because I know there's an existing team and I don't like like asking for books when there are existing teams there. So I said whenever you're thinking about you know changing creative, because all these books, they, they, they constantly change creative teams. Um, I said, think of me. Uh, and the editors asked, okay, but what would you do with it? And I said, in my infinite wisdom, I said, I want to do gothic, operatic, dramatic Batman. I want, <laughs> I want swooning and fainting and big capes. And, and they were like, that's cool. No one's done that sold. <laughs> so um, I, I really did want to do this kind of, the the best way I can think of explaining it is is um, have you watched Hannibal? The movie or the the, the TV show? I have not show. seen the show. No, that's the one uh, with so, uh, Mads Mikkelsen or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like everyone in that in that TV show talks like they've read volumes of Shakespeare and Proust and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like the FBI agent talks like he must have a library full of thick books at home, uh, and so. Everyone's always musing about the philosophy of their existence, blah, 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 blah. So I said, that is the perfect aesthetic for a Batman book because we've seen so much of the, I'm a soldier, I put on my things and I have my gadgets and I go beat up people, Batman. We, I felt like part of the reason the animated series was so successful was that it made it about the poetry of Batman. I mean, there's an entire episode in there about Batman trying to place roses on the road where his parents died. Like that is a very operatic, poetic thing to do. Mm. Um, and I feel like I was shocked when I read all the Batman runs. I was like, oh, wait, no one's actually done that aesthetic in the comics yet. Uh, I mean, there were things that came close. There's a lot of the Neil Adams stuff came close. A lot of the Kelly Jones uh, stuff came close. And there were a bunch of Elseworlds things that came close. But I felt like, no, I was going to do a detective run that was going to be concurrent with the DCU proper. But I was going to do a take on Batman that felt like we were looking at a, at a damaged, broken person trying to make sense of their life by putting on a bat costume and going out every night. night. Yeah. yeah. Is the operatic influence, does that influence the, the rhythm and the structure of the book? Yes, uh, very much so. I, I think the, if, if you look at the entire run so far, um, we've had the, the, the prelude, we've had act one, we're going to have act two, then we have an intermezzo, then we have an act three, and then we have the climax, which is very much classic operatic structure. To the point where even the intermission is like a musical piece. So, so um, without giving too much away, there will be. I think it's safe for me to say there will be a double shipping event soon that would that plays as the intermezzo of the whole arc. Um, so, so yeah, and then the the art styles on that is going to be amazing as well. Um, so yeah, so so the entire thing is very much structured like an opera. But also like an opera, it, it, it's it's preoccupied with the sense of history, with the sense of like we are doomed because we started from the place of doom. Uh, and so if you think about it, like what better character to investigate that with, but with Batman? Because one of the biggest criticisms I see of, of Batman stories is people saying like, oh, we always go back to his parents. I'm like, no, you don't understand. 
the entire thing is about that moment. And we should really question that moment. Who is he trying to save? Is he trying to save the kid? Is he trying to save his parents? Why does Batman exist? And the answer is always because two people got shot on the street. Uh, and so I think that's an interesting investigation to do. Um, the challenge is to do it in a new new way, in a new context. And hopefully we're doing that, yeah. You're working with some really great artists as well. Ivan Reese and you got Raphael Albuquerque there. Now, sometimes you have multiple artists on the same issue. Is that something you're aware of when you're writing the scripts? Because it seems so flawless how these styles work together when they shift and change sometimes. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm always, um, I always script for the artists that I work with. Um, sometimes, you know, schedule necessities mean that we need to get another artist on board. But if that's the case, then I will tailor the story to to work with the fact that I'm working with two two artists. Um, of course, the greatest example of that was the Two Face issue, which I don't think a lot of people notice. But what every spread was literally two different artists. It was Ivan yeah. Reese on one side, Raphael Albuquerque on the other, and then every page, every spread that came after the previous one was alternating. So we started off, I think, with Rafa on the right. Then the next spread is. Ivan on the left, Rafa. Uh, no, next part is Rafa on the left, Ivan on the right. Next part is Ivan on the left, Rafa on the right. Oh, so cool. it's always sort of bouncing back and forth between the two things. And then because they're such great collaborators, they're also really good friends. Uh, they were able to play off of each other's layouts. So in each case, Ivan's layout was a 90 degree flip and a 180 degree flip of uh rafa's layouts and and vice versa so every spread every spread is also a mirror oh. image of each other uh and then we were we were doing this story that was looking at two-face so it just yeah it just made perfect sense yeah wow that's fascinating man that's awesome <laughs> yeah, yeah and, i'm not and sure i noticed that, that they were different artists but i mean i did notice there was a lot of splits you know and, and i just yeah. you know figured it's two-face you know so it's like a lot of that you know mirroring and duality and everything and yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's really. And cool. then, and then the first line of the book is Harvey saying, "Too far. This has gone too far." And the last that's line it. of the book is Two Face going, "It won't matter how far we go. It won't be far enough." So that Two is also, always goes too far. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then writing writing Ten Eyed Man has been great. Right after the Two Face run, because oh, man. Uh, he never calls him Two Face. I think the first time he sees him, he calls him Mr. Double Trouble. The sex time, mm -hmm. second time he sees him, he, he calls him Mr. Half and Half. Yep. Uh, so it, it's just like coming up with different names to call Two-Face uh, every time I write Ten-Eyed Man. It's like the little joys of my life. Now, yeah. obviously, you're close with your white noise compatriots, right? And so you're using Ten-Eyed Man and the version that Dan was using, right? And then yeah. Dan was using uh, Father Howell. That Dan kind of reinvented and created yeah, completely actually. Yeah. Reinvented. Yes. Yeah. and then dan's using uh father valley in his yeah. asriel book which yeah. by the way we got to have dan back on this channel because he i read every asriel comic in existence nobody ever has handled that character as well <laughs> as dan waters like holy yeah. freaking cow so do you have conversations like hey yeah you use this but do you like when he like if he wanted to use father valley did he talk to you about a little bit about it and vice versa with with ten eyed man yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if anything, it's kind of become this inside joke. Like, I'm like, okay, so next I have to involve Azrael and Detective somehow. Uh, and, and and Dan's obviously continuing to write more things at DC. And yeah, it's the it's a, it's the mini Ramadanaverse going on there. <laughs> um, but no, it's a joy. It's the joy of working with people uh, on in the same universe, same characters. Um, you get to you get to pick and and choose what you want to take, and it helps that Dan's a very thoughtful writer, so his he has his aesthetic choices that are always fascinating to me. So I'm like, oh man, I wish I had done that, and now I feel like, oh wait, I can, I can just involve him in the second book and use that character that way. And the same thing with Dan, you know, Dan's been fascinated by. Um, damaged church going people and so immediately it was like i will use father valley in this so yeah 
I love it. It makes sense, right? You set up Father Valley. He's doing an Azrael book. We got to have that connection there, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Ouroboros wants to know, is there any connection of your work coming up with uh, with the Night Terrors event led by Joshua Williamson? And also says, great usage of Barbados and Detective. And I love that, too, because that throws yeah, back yeah. before. That's pre-Morrison stuff, right? But yeah, like, it's, Morrison it's really developed that. Milligan, I Milligan, think. yeah. I think last night, Dark Knight, Dark City, I think that, that was what yeah, it was. Yeah, Dark Knight, Dark City. That's what it is, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, like the Barbatos thing came in as a second idea because I was like, I want Bruce struggling with his inner demons while there's an external demon takeover going on because that was like an interesting scenario to play with. And then I went like, wait, what if the inner demons are also literal? What if, what if like Barbatos? Because I don't think that interpretation has been there, not, neither from Milligan nor, nor Morrison has has been this idea that what if Barbatos is just Bruce's or Batman's inner demon? And what if Batman's fight is not only against forces external, but also to keep that part of him constrained in some way? Um, which then leads you to ask the question of like, is that the tragedy that he will eventually be consumed by this thing inside of him? And he chooses to say, that's fine as long as I get to keep fighting another day. So, yeah, it just lends itself to the story really well. Um, and plus, you know, big red giant flying bat creature with operatic clothing, perfect fit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so what was the first part of the question? Night no, terrors. Yeah. So, uh, Night actually. Terrors, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think Dan Waters is going to be stepping in to write the two Night Terrors uh, uh, issues. Um, and so it does connect to the run, but it's also like a, an independent that is that kind of runs tangentially. Parent, That's kind of right, because Night Terrors is... I, maybe this is the wrong word, but kind of almost usurping the publishing line for a couple of months, right? Or something right. like that, I think. Like each title that ties into it's going to become tied into that title. Um, heck oh, yeah. I don't, know, I don't know why that happened. Um, uh oh. My camera's gone off. Uh... All right. While Rom is gone, we're going to uh, <laughs> address that. I got a super chat. Oh, it's Nick Barucci. Great interview, Robbie and Brian Eak. Love Rom V's writing. One of the smartest writers in the industry today. Thanks, Rom, for killing it every month. Everyone, please hit that thumbs up and show support. Nick, thank you for all the support you always show. And since Rom, oh, he's back. There you Good. go. I have, I have no idea what happened. My camera and mic just suddenly. It was DC being off. like, we're not ready to announce that Dan Waters <laughs> is taking over. For Giving protection. away too much. <laughs> yeah. Here's Nick yeah. Rucci, uh, publisher of Dynamite, with lots of great things to say about your writing. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I've met Nick a couple of times, uh, so pleasure. Nick's a good dude, man. He, I really love Nick. He's a big supporter of our channel. Helena says, has as someone who struggles with getting bored or even discouraged, I'd love to know how he maintains his vitality and passion when working on these stories. Um, just do things that don't bore me. Like I'm very, I'm very ruthless about going, I'm bored with this, I'm done. Because, you know, that's the one, that's the one crime you are not allowed to commit when you are writing stories. Don't write something that bores you. If you're doing that, then out. Um, because there are, there are a lot of reasons to, to do work. But if you're in comics and, uh, you know, it's a, diff it's a difficult industry to consistently be part of and you don't have the passion for the medium, don't have the passion for the stories, don't have the passion for the stuff that you're doing, then why are you doing it? Um, and so I've been, I've always been sort of very good about noticing when I get bored with things. Uh, and as soon as that happens, I'm like, peace, I'm out. Um, I don't know. Does that does that come off as as flippant or or uh, or like a diva sometimes? But you know, you have to have you have to have these rules for yourself. You have to have a little bit of that ego to go like, no, if I'm not doing something I'm very interested in doing, then why am I doing it? And I think 
the great pitfalls of a lot of creative careers is when you start doing things, creative things that are not motivated by your creative excitement for them. Hell yeah. That's yeah, some that's really awesome. good advice. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. To tag on to that. Cause like you, uh, I mean, one thing I've noticed about yours, I mean, you, you, uh, I don't know, these are experimental writing styles, the right term. Uh, I don't know. You, you know, you approach projects in all these different ways and, and, um, mm. you know, and, Earlier, yeah, when you mentioned being bored, uh, I would, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's coming from that. But uh, I didn't know if maybe you could talk more about different writing styles and experimentation that, you know, you're interested or. Yeah, usually. I think. For me. I tend to think about aesthetics as as. Mm. Another storytelling device. Um, usually people think about like, this is my story, I have it. And then the aesthetics are to make it look good. Whereas my philosophical contention is that, no, your story may be good, but how it is delivered is as important as the story itself. And so the writing style matters, uh, how your characters talk matters. Um, whether they talk in long run on sentences or they speak very little and are curt, whether they cuss a lot, whether they never cuss, whether they sound like they're from the pr previous century or they sound like uh, contemporary speakers. All of this makes a huge difference to how your story is perceived. Um, and I think, I think that's the difference between someone who plots well and someone who writes well. Like hmm. the plotting part, is, is a storyteller's job and everyone has to do it. But the writer's job is to decide how that delivery happens. And, and that's really the art. So when, and I've heard this, you know, argument from, from readers a lot or comic book critics a lot, or, or even creators who say that, oh, the writer does the script and then what makes it out to the reader is, is the art, is the visual stuff. Uh, and to an extent that is true, but you're looking at it superficially Again, how that visual stuff, how the characters talk, act, behave, speak, what words they use, all of that is important. And so I wouldn't say that my writing style is experimental. I would rather say that my writing style adapts and shifts as to what the story needs or what I think the story needs. Um, and so that's why it seems like I write in all these varying, like if you read Leila Star, very different from Detective, very different from Parody. So, um, but it's because I went through, in fact, probably the, the thing that I most think about before or, or during the outlining yeah. stage is that, how am I going to deliver this? How is this going to sound? How is this going to read? Yeah. Well, and yeah, it seems like that approach also, because like, you know, a lot of your work, you know, falls into various different genres and all that. And it, that, that sounds like a, you know, a way to have a good flexibility to be able to, you know, bounce, you know, you know, bounce around to different genres. And yeah, I mean, I mean, that, that is, that is really the challenge um, as a, as a writer is, can you, part of, part of the reason it's hard to do multiple genres is because each of those genres have expectations and you can't have, you can't have, you know, people speaking like they're in a, they're in Blade Runner, but write them as a romance novel, or you can, and therefore you must know exactly what that style contains. Uh, and so those are the two choices you get to make that either I don't write in a different genre because I don't know how to make this work in that genre or I learned the expectations of that genre and adapt my writing style so that it fits. And then mo the moment you start being able to do that is when really interesting ideas start popping into your head. Like, oh, can I do a mecha kaiju comic that is actually like really grounded human drama about trying to protect your kids? Uh, so again, you can't, you're you're using the expectations that already exist within the genre as devices, as tools to to deliver a new story in interesting ways to your readers. Oh yeah. Yep. I want to switch gears real quick to I see a lot of people talking about Carnage, a lot of people talking about the summer of the symbiotes or whatever. Are you tied into that event? Or maybe maybe you can't say yet, but like 
I'm assuming that you're tied into the Summer Symbiote event since you're doing work on Venom and Carnage, right? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say it here. Um, so I've restructured how much I've been doing this year. Uh, and so I've stepped back from the work that I've been doing on the Symbiote books, uh, partly because I was, you know, I did 50 issues of comics last year. Aside, apart from doing uh, creator-owned work, apart from doing, uh, I wrote bits of a video game last year. I wrote for an animated show last year. Uh, and I continue to do those things this year. But I don't want to do 50 comics aside from doing all of that. So I've had to, I've had to like restructure how much I'm doing. Uh, I also, like, aside from more releases of more formats of Layla Star. I didn't really have a creator on book last year. Uh, and that's never been the case for me. Hmm. So, um, but that's because I've been working on them. So this year there's going to be three creator on books, but, um, yes. yeah, I need to keep that balance. And so, um, part of that was deciding, deciding what to let go of. And, you know, there are incredibly talented people sitting behind the symbiote sort of corners of the Marvel universe right now. Oh, Al, you got Alex there. coming in, right? You got Alex yeah, yeah. coming in to take over Carnage for a little yeah, bit yeah. there, I know. Yeah, that's right. So so Alex has taken over Carnage for a bit. Uh I think there's a crossover uh that's part of that as well. So so yeah, so I it felt like the right time to 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 back off of that. And I will I will watch these incredibly talented creators uh take the threads that I that I put down and uh excitedly see all the crazy places they will go with. Yeah. And and since you, you know, then you could be like Al, Alex, like, y'all, what what you're dropping the ball. Do you need to do this? And no, I'm sure you're gonna let them <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm I'm still part of the symbiote Slack. So I still get to peek in on everything that's happening. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Um what so the venom right? Venom is an interesting book because you got Al Ewing doing this really the most cosmic timey-wimey high concept interpretation of Venom ever, right? Yeah. And then you're doing like more of the Dylan stuff, right? That was yeah. grounded. What was it like working with a collaborator like that, structuring a book together? I mean, I, I came on that book because I knew Al was going to be working on it. So part of my excitement was that I'd be working with Al and, and that's been great. Uh, to be honest, like he already had an idea of what he wanted to do with Venom, but also it was such a, the, can you imagine if that book had just been Venom in space, there would be very little connection to the Marvel universe at large because he was going to be off in like future times at the end in this garden. Uh, and so, um, part of the reason the Normie book existed was to provide that sort of grounding sensibility to the book. But we also didn't want two separate books to exist. We wanted one story, one narrative. And so, yeah, what better way to use the father-son connection as like this narrative glue between the two books. So everything that happened on the Normie side of things would have an impact for Eddie when, when he was announced side of things and then everything that happened on eddie's uh side of things would have an impact on normie's life here um in in form of meridius and bedlam and all of that so um yeah i think we i think people were skeptical when we started off and then i think about 10 issues in people were like wait a minute this is crazy this is bigger than i thought it was going to be so yeah no it was a it was a exciting entertaining experience, experience. to, to so do you, do you just write your bits and he writes his bits and, and you just kind of talk them out? Like, obviously you're writing the scripts that are basically based on, on, on Dylan and, and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and stuff like that. Right. And then I guess he's doing his thing, but obviously you're talking, you're part of that symbiote yeah, slack. Yeah. Right. So hashtag also, symbiote slack. Like, also Al is also in the UK. And so uh, it's maybe an hour's worth of travel to come to London sometimes. So we would do crap lunch or grab a couple of burgers sit down and figure out what we were doing over the next you know six or seven issues uh and once that was done then it's a question of going away and, and writing those issues but the larger storyline was always something that we had already worked out ahead of time nice nice with your carnage book i i at first i was into it and i started kind of i don't know i think my expectations because i've been a venom and carnage fan since they were introduced right 
And as a reader, I have expectations of what I want to see. And y'all are subverting those expectations on both of these books. And if, with Carnage, there was a moment there. I'm like, I want to keep reading it because it's wrong, but I'm kind of losing it a little bit, right? But then when we start bringing it in together with him, like rebuilding the Necro Sword and all that kind of stuff, like I got so excited. And like, that's why you trust people like Rom V because it does pay off, right? And in hindsight, I really love your Carnage book because you're doing something completely different. Now, I know we did a show with my buddy Manny with like David Boer and I think Eric Burnham was mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. I was like, Carnage has got some dumb stories. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you navigate? What do you do? Well, you just did something completely different is what you did. And I love yeah. that. I love it yeah. so much. Yeah, and, and to be honest, like, I've always had that in one form or the other with every book that I worked on. Like, Swamp Thing, there was a contingent of people who were like, oh, this is not Alec Holland, so I'm not reading it. Um, and then 10 issues in, they were like, oh, wait, this is actually a really good run. So I'm reading it. <laughs> um same thing with detective when we started off they were like oh wait a minute this is like some kind of poetic intellectual batman who wants to read that and then 10 issues in they're like oh wait the character studies are great i'm i'm here i'm i'm loving it so i think with carnage it was a similar thing people were, i think there was a very strong contingent of people who were like oh no cletus cassidy's not here um so this is not my carnage or there were people who were like, wait, Carnage's not eating everyone's brains and, and killing people. What's going on? Why does he sound like uh, some kind of poetic, intelligent guy? What's going on? And um, yeah, and then issue eight, Cletus Cassidy was back. And suddenly people were like, wait, what's happening? And then the Necro sword and, and all blood came back. And people were like, wait, wait, wait. It connects back to the Donny Cate stuff. What's going on? That's the great joy of, of being a writer. I, the part of the reason I kind of mostly ignore feedback, good or bad, when I'm, when I'm in the process of writing something is because the only response I have to anyone saying either like, oh, this is not what I expected or this is exactly what I expected is the same response, which is just you wait. Just you wait. It pays off, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Every time. I think that's the, to me, those are the kind of stories that I love. Like something happens in issue three that you think is one thing. And then you read up to issue 10 and it completely reframes your understanding of what you were looking at then. So, yeah. Now, last time you were here, you mentioned that you would love to do a Doctor Strange book. Yes. And I see Comics Joe saying Rom V for Doctor Strange. And we just had a really Important. awesome run on Doctor Strange wrap up with the Trad Moore stuff. Did you get to check that out? Yes. I mean, Trad and I have been friends for, for a while. I always check out his stuff when it comes out. Um, and yeah, it, as expected, Trad's also been a, I don't know, I don't know if you know this, but he's a big fan of an artist called Alex Gray, who does all of the album covers for Tool. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you can definitely see that influence in that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was reading through the Doctor Strange book. And I was like, I see you, Trad. I see your influences yeah. here. With all so the like, eyes and shit. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I'm a big fan of great. Alex Gray, too. So you you still got some good ideas for Doctor Strange. It's still a possibility in the future, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these things, these things come around. Uh, there will be a time. Uh, I'm just I'm just doing way too many things at the moment. So this year, the idea is to do a bunch of creator own stuff, continue on detective, um, and then we'll see we'll see what comes around next year. I'm really pumped to hear that you're going to be doing some more creator own stuff. As much as yeah, I love yeah. your DC and Marvel work, like I, I, the bread and butter for me is just original ideas, original concepts, and and flowing from that. But I'm loving what you're doing with the big two, and it's good because you have you now have made a name more so for yourself than before. Where when you launch a creator own work. I think it's going to launch bigger than before, right? Like, I, I mean, obviously, these Savage Shores, I see Black Moomba being mentioned in the chat. I finally got a copy that my buddy Mike got me, buddy. Nice. And, yep, got some original Rom V work in there. Ah! Oh, so that's nice. nice. That's nice. It's, it's nice. I Sometimes I just touch it at night and I try to <laughs> try to get a little bit of that, <clears throat> that, that inspiration from you. But uh, Many Days of Layla Star, that hadn't even come out yet when we last chatted with you. Holy cow, bro. You got my top comic for two years. 
right? Because Blue and Green was my number one comic when the year it came out, and then Mini Deaths of Layla Star. That book is, and it is one of the top sellers at my comic shop. Like I have to order, I have to order multiple, multiple copies of that just so that I can have it in stock. People are really resonating with that, man. Like that is such a good book. You and uh, Philippe did yeah. such an amazing job on that, man. Um, I give that book to people like as a present, like that is a book. I think that anybody can jump into even without much experience with comics and it will resonate with them because you told a story about grief and death, but through all of that, at the end of it, I felt so uplifted and hopeful and realized it was actually a story about life. Right. And, and do you just wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit because Mini Desolate of Star was so good, man. Yeah, no, that book. I mean, you can you can control a lot of things, like like being on top of Robbie's yearly comics list, for example. <laughs> but but there are, there are things you cannot control, like the kind of success that a book has in the long run. Um, when issue one of that came out, it 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 did well. Um, I I was already a known entity in, in places. It did well, but. It wasn't one of those sort of, oh my God, it sold whatever, 300,000 copies. It wasn't one of those. It did it. It came out. But by the time the five issues had come out, uh, you know, I was starting to get responses from people that were like, I really needed this at, at a time where I had lost someone close to me. Or I was feeling really sort of distressed by the pandemic. And this book has brought a sort of stoicism and joy back to, to, to the way I look at things. And I think that's the kind of stuff that I really, I really love and enjoy. Um, so I was talking to, I was talking to a couple of people uh, collaborating with on, on some non-comic stuff and they were like, Oh, where do you turn to for feedback? I'm like, I actually try to avoid getting any kind of feedback on stuff. Uh, like, yeah, it's great to, great to have, your things reviewed, but as a creator, you shouldn't be making choices based on how well your work is reviewed or not. Um, but I will absolutely every day of the week take those really personal sort of this book mm. evoked something in me. Like that is that is what I live for. That that's the reason I write stories. Uh, and so that you know ties in very nicely to part of the reason I was like, no, I need to balance better the creator owned and the and the sort of big two stuff but big two stuff people are people are reading that and don't get me wrong there are there there are people reading that for the quality of those stories and they want to be emotionally moved and excited by those stories as well but they're reading that because they're following the ongoing story of a character that has existed before me and that will exist long after i'm done working on that character but with something like Layla Starry, that book only exists because I have something to say. Uh, and I think creatively, it's very important to always be working on one thing that, that you feel has that level of personal importance to you. Like, I want to say something. That's why I'm making this book. Um, and I had missed that last year. Uh, like, I'll tell you, I had this moment that I watched, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but I know it's up for a bunch of Oscars tonight. Uh, there's a movie called Banshees of Inish Sharon. It's my favorite uh, movie of last year, man. I actually yeah, yeah. was going to ask you yeah, about yeah. that movie today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I did a whole newsletter post about it when I when I walked out of the theater after watching it. But that, you realize, for those who have seen it, um, and for those who haven't, I'm, not, I'm avoiding spoilers, but that movie could be shot in a single theater without any of the beauty of the, you know, the island or the countryside or any of that. And it still works. It doesn't need the big special effects. It doesn't need the great set. It's just a story about people being messy people. And there's beauty in that. And mm -hmm. fundamentally, I feel like that's why stories are successful. Because even if you're setting the story underwater, it has to be about people in some way. Um, and I felt like I had when I, after I finished watching that movie, I stepped out and I'm like, wait, why am I not creating more of that kind of stuff? Uh, and then it was really after watching that, I came back and I went, okay, 
I need to get in touch with some of my editors and say, hey, I'm doing too much of this one thing and not enough of the other. Oh. Yeah, that movie That's is great. so freaking good. Brian, you got to watch it. You got to watch it tonight, yep. I guess. Like, skip Rock and Robbie well, Live. Well, just watch Banshees of Venice Year. Because that movie well, well, is so good, man. Well, yeah, I've been, uh, my teenager, my teenage daughter and I have been planning on watching it. It's just we haven't uh, had a lot of sickness. We haven't been able to connect and everything. I think we're going to try to get that, uh, watch that this weekend. So, yeah, just yeah, phenomenally I'm... interesting movie. It, I've also been on a, a um, McDonough binge of late. You know, his his brother also does plays and, and films. Uh, and and so it's an interesting filmography to watch if, if anyone's interested. Uh, just seeing someone who started off as a playwright coming to mm -hmm. films, making films, um, find that level of confidence to just go like, yeah, I'm just going to take a story that could have been a play. I'm going to make it as a really beautiful film. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's such a powerful movie with great performances too. And I haven't dived into his, I haven't even seen in Bruges, right. Which is like the same actor, yeah, same yeah, writer, yeah, yeah, director, yeah. right. Like, yeah, so yeah. I need, I need to dive in and check his workout because, you know, I'm sitting here and, and, you know, one of the things I like to do is, is gripe about the, the situation with, with movies, with comics, like, oh, we need more original content. This it's still out there, you know, it's just not the big, it's not what everybody necessarily is talking about. Yeah. But when I finally watched Banshees, I was like, these are the movies, this is my bread and butter. This is what made me fall in love with story. This is what yeah, made yeah. me fall in love with cinema, with comics, with stories like this. And you're right, it could be done on a stage. It has just as much impact. And yeah, I mean, um, but that's a great contrast. Like we live in the era of the I don't know, X hundred million dollar budget CGI yeah. blockbuster extravaganza. And then like movies, there are other movies like this and they struggle to find theater dates for release because the theaters are just full of the next sort of, here's the next phase of this huge franchise thing. And it's great to enjoy that, but these things exist and they only exist therefore because of the creative motivation of their of their creators and and so that's very important uh to yeah. keep that's very important to to encourage um so yeah that's where my head's been that's why you're you're getting three creator owned books uh this year oh that's i'm so it. excited Great news. You know, Great that news. means that rom's got a chance to make best of the year again and you, know, you never know <laughs> what's going to happen you never know um speaking of which you were working on a creator owned project that got kind of um uh, stalled out just a little bit everybody's wanting to know i've seen it in the chat a few times what's going on with radio apocalypse how soon can we expect to see more of that so radio apocalypse kind of faltered because of essentially the covid pandemic while we were working on that book i think anand aditya and myself had covid twice and so <laughs> When you have that, it's like, okay, I'm ready to go now. And Anna's like, nope, sorry, I've got COVID. I can't work. And then Anna's like, I'm ready to go. And like, oh, I can't do anything because I'm, I've am i got COVID. And then the issues weren't getting done on time. And it just felt like, okay, we're struggling with this. And rather than sort of kill ourselves trying to make this happen alongside other projects, because I can, to be very honest, I can write four projects at the same time not a problem at all but anand can't work on four projects at the same time but also he needs to consistently continue working if he's going to pay his bills right so uh unfortunately the amount of time it took to create that book uh it ran into trouble because anand had to take on other work to, to continue working he couldn't hit pause when i fell ill or i did fell Ill. uh and so that's where things are. I don't see myself continuing that book without Anand on it uh, and Aditya on it, because uh, that would it would mean we were not creating the same book. Uh, and so it has to wait until Anand and my and Aditya's schedules align once again for us to be able to continue working on that. It happens sometimes, you know. All all great creators I know have unfinished projects. Where's, Where's that? that? Alan Al Moore's uh, Bill Alan Moore and Bill Sinkevich unfinished project. Yeah, the big numbers. Yeah. yeah, big numbers. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where, where's where's uh, Frontier from Jonathan Hickman? I heard about that one a long time ago. I'm just curious. Maybe yeah. you can ask him next time you see him. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it happens. And, you know, we were talking about Planetary earlier. 
Me and Brian remember <laughs> waiting a long time for Planetary to actually finish yeah. and wrap up, yeah. right? 27 took, uh, what, two years? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, so. sometimes sometimes it happens. Um, and then it, it's also like weird creative energy stuff, right? Like mm. the energy you had a year ago when you were working on issue two is not the same energy you have when you're working on issue three. And then maybe it doesn't feel like it's part of the same book anymore. So all kinds of weird internal considerations. So it is it is what it is. Hopefully we'll find a place and a time where schedules will and we'll come back and, and work on it. Yeah, I really but, hope so because I what I care more about is just having the story complete with that same vision, with that creative team, with that energy. Like I don't care yeah. how long it takes. Like we I don't think the biggest problem in the industry is passion projects you know, taking a little bit longer, right? Yeah. Because as long as once that book's out there, the book is out there. It's perennial. It can stand on its own. It's not something like DC or Marvel where it has to be done now. And, 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 and life takes precedence. You know what I'm saying? When people are, are Ill, when they fall ill, you got to take care of yourself. Uh, when people need to take on projects to pay the bills, you got to do that. You, life happens. And sometimes I think us as fans can be really hard because we think, oh, it's so easy. It's not easy to make a comic. It's not easy to make a comic on the level of Radio Apocalypse, where you're literally, <laughs> you're you're literally. I can't think of a book that has more audience participation. You're like, listen to this, <laughs> and it works. Like, you 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 care so much about rhythm and momentum, yeah. right? And when I put on that uh, that Springsteen st song. It affected the the flow of my reading in yeah. that book, and I think that was your intent on that. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. And all your emotions get heightened because the lyrics of the song are talking about something you're seeing in the book, but neither of them are actually connected. But you're forming that connection in your head, so yeah. it's a very powerful feeling to have when you start connecting two narratives in a way that makes sense to you. Um, yeah, no, I'm. You're absolutely right, but also, yeah, I want to talk about like some measure of creative naivety from a new creator. Like I've, I only, Black Mumbo was made in 2016, so I've only been doing this for six, seven years now. Um, and you start off, and nobody knows you exist. Like Black Mumbo, what people told me, oh, it's sorry, yeah, it will never be published. You might as well go to Kickstarter because we don't know what to do with a you know book that's in black and white and telling stories about people in mumbai we don't know how to sell that fair enough and then flip around to like 2020 2019 i was being offered projects to where like i remember walking into new york comic con not having a single greenlit project uh in my uh, on my on my hands and then walking out going like oh well i know what i'm doing for the next two years hmm. but also in your head, you never stop saying yes to things because partly, sure, it's that sort of freelancer ner nervousness, like, oh, if I say no, will they never come back and ask me? Um, but also, it's that childish enthusiasm, like, yes, I want to work on everything, but it's, yeah, it's impossible. And, and I think part of growing up as a creator is sort of learning, um, to, to know, knowing where that wall is, where your wall is, and when do you start saying no? When do you start saying, okay, I'm doing too much. I want to step back. Any chance on a Black yeah. Mumba reprint we're getting from Michael here? Um, I've, I've got, got hundreds of copies still uh, uh, in, in store. I, I, there's a store called Eye for London Prints uh, out of the U.K., uh, and they they send out these books. Uh, they're they're like my outlet store, if you will. Uh, they're they're different business, but um, essentially there's hundreds of copies more available. So it's always been in print, uh, just not from any major publisher. And I have had offers from publishers to to reprint that. But I also think there's something beautiful about like no, I it was my first book. I walked to a post office every day for three weeks to to mail them all out that's carrying like 300 <laughs> books on my back it's a memory i like to have and i think like putting a label on it and then a barcode 
just kind of takes away from that. No, it's mm. it's an indie book and it's meant to be like if you've got it, you've got it. <laughs> nice. I've got it. I finally got it. Damn it. Thank you, Mike, for that. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, at some point I want to return to doing projects like that as well. Uh even though like right now I'm in a position where I pitch to a publisher, usually that book gets made, which is lovely and nice. But also now I've started thinking about like, okay, what kind of projects will a publisher never say yes to and therefore yeah. i can take it to kickstarter and do something crazy with it um like i want to do i'm already working on it so i, I feel like it's fair enough to to talk about this it's a personal project but i want to do a project that will only have a limited number of copies like a few hundred but every copy is unique in that uh, the idea is the, the story it tells it is in the form of a, of a person's found journal. Um, but it's going to be the art, the lettering, everything. So it's not, it's not comics, it's illustrated prose, but the art, the, the lettering, everything looks like someone actually wrote this down in a journal. And then the idea is to that, Robbie, your copy may not have a few pages because they got torn away or they, they fell off. Somebody else's copy will have those pages. Uh, your copy may have page number five very clearly written and legible. And, and you know, it's talking about how rain, uh, you know, there was unexpected rain that day. And then somebody else's copy, half of the page is not legible because raindrops have fallen and the ink has smudged out and you can't read it. So. You can't do that. You can't do that with standard publishing. But it's, but such, it's such a fascinating, fascinating way to tell a story, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's like bringing performance art into it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the book is performing its story yeah. to you. Yeah. And we and Brian are going to have to get 10, 10 copies each so we can put them all out. It's like that. It's like that Flaming Lips album where you had to have four CD <laughs> players playing, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but you're never meant to have the complete story. You're only meant to have... Yeah whatever story you're ha you have you don't and then, you, you just don't test us because me and brian will make sure we get every single copy <laughs> <laughs> well that pretty much guarantees my kickstarter then so great. yeah there we go <laughs> <laughs> just yes, let, let us know when it goes live yeah great. brian before we wrap up because rom's busy man and so are we we got we all we can't keep him here forever um but brian what what any final thoughts or questions man well um yeah the uh I was thinking a lot when because I, I did go back and I, I reread Many Deaths of Lady of the Star, which conveniently, by the way, has a new deluxe edition, which I highly recommend going yeah, out. I need editing. to pick it's that got, up. Yeah, it's gorgeous, man. It's got some great back matter in it, uh, preliminary sketches, and an article from uh, panel by panel in there too. It's uh, really good yeah. stuff. Um, and uh, now that that one didn't have like much, you know, uh, music necessarily, but I, one of the one of the things I'm picking up from a lot of your work uh, with. Uh, you know, blue and green obviously directly deals with music and then radio yeah. apocalypse and, and, uh, and this detective run, you know, with the, the opera style, which yeah, I thought it was cool because like you you were mentioning the intermezzo and the different acts and, and the annual yeah. was called motif. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was really cool. Cause when you're talking about looking stuff up, I, I have very little familiarity with opera. I've, I've been trying to watch uh, Tristan in the soul because of, uh, Dennis camps, um, yeah. you know, Maxwell's demons and I'm, yeah, I'm trying yeah, to get yeah. through Finnegan's wake. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but so Good luck. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's my sixth attempt. Um, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, I guess like, uh, I just wondered if you wanted to talk about how important music was to, you know, cause it's, you know, comics are a great medium because, you know, you're combining visual arts with, you know, narrative and things, but, you know, bringing music in is like a whole nother dimension and just, I mean, frankly, I think both art forms work in very similar ways. Um, and I, and I mentioned this before the comics as band analogy uh, is very clearly there for everyone to see, right? You have the drummer, the guitarist, the vocalist, mm -hmm. the, the, the bass player and comics is, is similar in, in, in a lot, in a lot of ways. You have the letter, color, the artist, the, the writer, and your aim in both cases is to produce a piece of work that is impossible for you to say where one person's contribution began and another person's contribution ended, right? Like, how do you know the bass drift didn't come from the vocalist humming a tune? How do you know 
that the the guitar solo wasn't actually written by the bassist or like the guitar solo wasn't formed on the basis of what the drummer is doing at the time so uh i think that kind of creative collaborative energy is is true to both mediums uh but also fundamentally i think comics and music um are really close because they're both mediums of juxtaposition right um usually the the way you structure a song is, is also by juxtaposing a bass line with uh, uh, a a melody that has then a riff put next to it then uh, a beat mm. that that and so you're taking all these disparate elements and placing them next to each other and finding joy in moments of coincidence resonance playing them off of each other Sometimes they clash, sometimes they combine, and they do so in unexpected ways. Comics is exactly the same thing in that you're, you're juxtaposing art with words, but also juxtaposing art next to each other, uh, but also juxtaposing two pages next to each other. Um, then you're juxtaposing, you're finding ways to, within even, even within the words, to... The character, what the character is saying is on the page in the words, but how it's placed next to the art or what panel it's placed in or what panel the caption box sits over changes your experience of the story. Um, mm -hmm. And I think music works in the same way. Like you, you take a G chord and, and you know, you play it with this set of vocals. It's a happy song you play it with a completely different set of vocals and it becomes like a melancholy sad song uh, and and if you think about start thinking about book art forms that way there's so much crossover uh mm -hmm. it's why i think music works in as a as a element of reading a comic as well because there's rhythm because there's interplay between how the music is structured and how the page is structured as you said it starts it starts defining for you how you read a page. Uh, in a lot of ways, I mean, people have written at great length about the user's nine panel grid and these savage chores. But m my initial motivation when I first said, okay, this is what we need to do, was because I wanted a metronome playing mm -hmm. in the background when you were reading the comic. And so the nine panel grid becomes this kind of constant. Tick, 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 tick. Yeah. It doesn't let you read at a different pace. Um, even if you want to. And I think that's an interesting tool and a level of control to have over your narrative. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Cause like, yeah, I don't know the, uh, it's definitely working, you know, with the, with the books. Cause like, uh, I, I actually, uh, uh, a friend of mine asked me for suggestions for uh, get his, uh, uh, brother some comics for christmas and uh mm -hmm. i got a text two weeks ago that uh because i suggested blue and green and and uh, these savage shores and and uh uh so you got a new super fan <laughs> oh, thank you, you know, thank uh, you yeah uh, because uh, that the stuff just it works so well and and uh and uh it, it yeah like you know it, it does you know it helps you uh with different emotions while you're reading it and everything but it but it, it's also that joy of discovery too because like you know a lot of the stuff you know you know, I'm not familiar with this. So I'm like, Oh, now I need to go down this. And then, you know, as I'm listening to other, you know, music inspired, it's like, you know, other things are hitting. I, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's a wonderful package. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, I mean, I had the same experience. The first time I experienced something like that was watching uh, Shinichiro Watanabe's Cowboy Bebop, mm, uh, which yeah. is, which is the anime. And then I watched Samurai Champloo, which was also based off of a style of music. Yep. Um, and so I realized that, oh, I see what this person is doing. Their narratives are based off of their these styles of music that they enjoy. And Cowboy Bebop has a rhythm. It has it has an obsession with certain kinds of stories. Um, same way Samurai Champloo has an obsession. But I think Samurai Champloo does, goes one step further because there's now meta narrative involved in there because he's talking about Champloo is a, is a kind of style of music that they use is, is a music that mixes different eras, different styles. Like it takes hip hop and mixes it with traditional Japanese music. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes hip hop and has Japanese instruments in it. And so what he was doing with the narrative there is he was taking samurais as a, as a traditional Japanese construct 
but mixing it with other types of storytelling, other eras of storytelling. And he says he's going to do this right at the beginning. In episode one, when you start, he starts off with contemporary Japan. And then the caption says, no, no, 500 years ago. And then it rewinds <laughs> all the way back to Edo era samurais. So he tells you he's going to do this right at the beginning. That blew my mind. And and yeah, I was thinking about comics and music in, in, in similar ways. And it, it unlocked a lot of things for me watching that. I love yeah, Cowboy yeah. Bebop and in particular Samurai Champloo. Samurai Champloo is one of my yeah, favorite yeah. animes of all time. I like adore it. I own it on Blu-ray. It's just such a cool thing. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. happy to see you. And Dan did a uh, yeah, Cowboy yeah. Bebop uh, miniseries that was really yeah, yeah. good. And I, I think it was, it was real good. It was able to carry like through the art and the story, like that rhythm as well. Like it, it, there were moments reading his uh, Cowboy Bebop with the art where I felt like I could hear the, Da -da 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 -bow -bow. Yeah, I could hear it. I could feel it. Man. So my gift to Dan, uh, I have a I have a similar one here, but uh, my gift to Dan was this kind of music box that you can that you can wind up and plays Little Bird from from Cowboy Bebop. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, but, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, I actually put that one on for my uh, four year old the other day. And She's nonverbal and everything, but uh, I, I caught her actually staring at it for a while. The Cowboy Bebop one. She, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was like, I was pretty happy with that. So maybe I'll have to try Champloo with her because, uh, yeah. Because I was. Have you ever, ever like, watched that one, Brian? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, okay. yeah. That, that's the one where New Jobbies like, did some of yeah, the music. Yeah. Too. Yeah. And uh, that, that's, how I, that's how I remember getting into that whole style of music, actually, was that channel. Japanese lo fi beats. Yep. It's so oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ron, before we get out of here, do you have any con appearances coming up this year? Uh, probably be at San Diego. Uh, and I'm doing a bunch of European conventions as well. Uh, I may come back later half of the year uh, to the States again, but it just depends on, on a bunch of things. Uh, the, the least interesting of which is the fact that I need to renew my passport. So. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we hope you, that you make it to some cons in the state soon because we'd love to see you in person. Uh, me and Brian are always at Heroes Con. I go to MegaCon. This is this actually be my first MegaCon. I'm meeting Frank Miller. Oh, very I, nice. I got the Frank Miller ticket, and uh, oh, you did have one. Really, yeah, I'm really freaking excited for that, man. I'm gonna be so nervous, but I can only get one thing signed, and I'm gonna bring my Daredevil 181 because mm -hmm. as much as I want my Ronin number one signed. My Daredevil 181 is already signed by Klaus Jansen. So I kind of want to uh, kind of want to have the two there, right? Yeah. So uh heck yeah, Ron. Thank you so much for joining us and reaching My out. Pleasure. Very, very pumped out for the vigil, everybody. Check it out. It comes out in May. Um, it looks like it's gonna be something very special and very cool. Detective comics going on right now. Um, lots of cool stuff. Apparently, some creator-owned work. So Ron, just final. Yeah, thought. I've got I've got a creator-owned book coming out from Dark Horse later this year. I've got a creator-owned book coming out with image which we didn't talk about at all but it's a bit crazy um it's comics rashomon completely uh oh cool yeah yeah doing interesting things with layering narratives there um and then i think the the next collaboration with philippe will also be out closer to end of the year so three things it's plenty of opportunities for you to come back rom and have another conversation <laughs> sounds so great you and anytime, anytime. Anytime. And and same to you. Anytime. Anytime yeah. you want to just you could be like, hey man, I'm bored tonight. What you doing? I'll be like, nothing now. Let's let's, <laughs> let's do a stream. Let's do it. Thank All right. you. That's All right. very we kind. Should do a, we should do a movie review of Banshees of Inishiran and let Brian Sounds find great. a reading or something. Well, watch it, I should say. Anyway, thank you out there for the chat. Y'all have been dolls tonight. Thank you so much to Rom. Thank you to Brian. Thank you to everybody who has supported this channel and Rom's yeah, work. Thank you. Continue to support it. I am Rockin' Robbie, and on behalf of everybody here, station. Pop, pop. <laughs>